All right, well, welcome everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, and I just first of all like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I am presenting from today. I'm on Bunurong country, so I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners past and present uh, and all their beautiful culture. Okay, so welcome. Thank you for coming along on this chilly, chilly day. Um, hopefully you're all warm inside. I made the decision to run this from outside and I'm regretting it now. <laughs> but uh, it's a, a bit, some of the stuff's a bit dirty to have inside, so I'll, I'll power through it. Um, so welcome to Home Composting. Um, I will run through what we're going to cover today, but also in the early stages, I'll get a bit of feedback from you all on what it is that you're wanting to hear from, you know, hear about as well, because um, I imagine we've got quite a range of different uh, skill levels and different interest levels in composting, worm farming and bakashi. Uh, so obviously I want to tailor it to you guys as much as possible. Um, and I will be unsharing my screen to actually demonstrate things to you. Um, so, in fact, I'm just going to make myself a co-host on my other screen as well. And that way I can spotlight the video when I need to. Okay, um, so just a bit of... Um, Bit of uh, sort of housekeeping in the beginning. Um, if you have any questions as we go, pop them in the chat. You'll probably find a lot of them do get answered just a little bit further along in the presentation. We do have two hours for the presentation today, but I will aim to get it finished in an hour and a half, um, just because I think everyone will be exhausted after hearing me talk for that long, to be honest. Um, but I'm certainly happy to stay on for anyone that does have questions, even if we can wrap up in a reasonable amount of time. Um, I'll keep you on mute during the presentation, but if you do need to say something or if I'm sort of um, asking a question and you want to um, pipe in, you can just hit your space bar uh, to override your mute. If you don't have your mouse handy, I know my mouse goes to sleep if I haven't used it for a few minutes. Um, as I mentioned, I am recording the presentation, so I will. Uh, circulate that via council to you um, because council has all your details. So I'll send the link to Pip and it will be either in a Dropbox or I will endeavour to get it up on YouTube. Um, what else? I can provide the slides as well, but obviously you'll have the video um, and there's some links to free resources at the end as well, which will hopefully help you on your composting journey. Now, I didn't make a poll for you to fill in. I just thought I'd leave it kind of, I wanted open text rather than yes or no type answers. So if you want to jump in the chat, uh, which is the little chat button, I'm not sure if you can see my controllers here, but it's right down the bottom of the screen uh, in near the centre. And just pop in a few comments um, about what you're wanting to get out of today. If there's a, you know, if you're, whether you're a beginner or advanced or have specific troubleshooting that you need to do, or you're wanting to learn about a composting method that you've not been using before, um, I'd love to be able to tailor anything that I cover to make sure that I cover that. So I'll just give you a moment to, to write anything in the chat. Not sure if you can see see the chat on my screen or not. I just while I just see if any comments come in, I will just see what the notification is on my other screen. All right. Oh, you're all very quiet today, but that's okay. <laughs> I'll close the chat and I will keep an eye on it. Um, and at the end, when we have question time, I'll revisit the chat and work through your questions so that any that aren't answered as a part of the presentation, we will answer at the end. Um, so, oh, we do have a question. I'm interested in understanding Bakashi composting and have tried using it, but have not been able to do it properly. Awesome. Yes, we're definitely going to cover Bakashi today. Um, tumbler bins. Uh, Emma says, I have a tumbler bin, which is great, but I can't seem to get the mix of ingredients right. Soggy, so I added paper. 
but now it looks a bit grey and lacking in more green stuff. Help! Um, so we'll look at that as well. We'll cover a section called Composting Fundamentals where we look at the ingredients um, and getting the balance right of the greens and browns and a bit of other troubleshooting. Uh, someone else is having some issues with Bakashi. I'm sure by the end of this session, um, you'll be all absolute pros at Bakashi um, because it's so forgiving, but it's just about understanding a little bit of the underlying science. Once you've got that nailed, it is really easy. Um, but it, you can wreck it. I've got a Bakashi here that I just emptied that I'd forgotten about and wrecked. Um, but when we cover Bakashi, I'll teach you a bit more about that. So hopefully you're really confident um, and we can have a look at, I've got a fairly empty tumbler over here that we can have a look at that's probably similar to your situation, Emma, um, where I just haven't got the balance right because I just don't use it enough um, between all my other systems and the chooks. <laughs> so what we'll cover, we'll touch firstly on food waste, what the issue is, um, because whilst you're probably all here for either the love of gardening or wanting to do something about food waste, there's always going to be someone in your life who maybe challenges you or is hard to get on board. So having a bit of knowledge about the food waste issue uh, is often a good way to convince them. We'll look at some of the different composting systems out there. Um, so just so that you can compare, I guess, the key differences between composting, worm farm, Bakashi, um, how they can work together as well in unison. We will look at composting fundamentals. So looking at everything from ingredients to pH. So just getting all those um, variables right, because if you can get the variables right, then you really don't have a lot of extra work to do or a lot of troubles to have to troubleshoot. Uh, of course, we'll look at maintenance and harvesting, which is all very straightforward, but obviously different, different systems. Um, we will look at troubleshooting, which will also be covered a little bit through letting a few people in. We'll be covered a little bit through the fundamentals anyway. So as we look at the composting fundamentals, we um, will probably avoid the need for having to troubleshoot down the track. Now, for those that have just joined us, um, we are recording the session and um, I'll be sharing the presentation via council, uh, either via YouTube or Dropbox link or both. So um, feel free at any stage to open up your video so that we can see your smiling faces. Um, but I don't think in the recording you'll actually be able to be seen. I can edit it out. Uh, so we're just running through the workshop overview. We're up to ongoing support. So we'll give you um, some resources where you can get some ongoing support and help. Uh, and of course, time for questions at the end. Now I'm just going to add, Pip is here from council to join us. I'm just going to add you as a co-host, Pip. That way. If Thanks, Ella. <laughs> if my internet drops out, it's usually pretty good, but with lockdown, there's a lot of pressure on <laughs> the internet system. I'm actually using my hotspot, which is a bit more reliable, but if it drops out, it just means we've got a bit of continuity. The meeting won't stop um, and you can just talk amongst yourselves for a moment while I come back on. But because I've got two cameras on the go, should be right. I'm using two separate hotspots. <laughs> got to be prepared for everything in these days of COVID. Okay, so moving along, I um, just wanted to start with a bit about food waste. I'm hoping you can't hear all the background traffic. I've got a filter on, so hopefully you can't hear it. Um, so one of the issues with food waste is it might not seem like a lot of food waste to us. It might just be one apple core or one this or one that, but with, you know, what is there 25 million Australians who might have an apple core each a day um, and looking at all the other sorts of food waste that we throw out, it really adds up. So we throw out enough every year in Australia to fill 10,000 Olympic swimming pools um, or the, the equivalent of 60,000 blue whales, uh, a million elephants or 9 million cows. So it's a heck of a lot of food waste that we throw out in waste and in volume. Uh, and of course that has other implications. So some of the implications with food waste uh, are the greenhouse gas emissions, which I'll talk about in a little bit further along. 
Um, so in terms of food waste, there's avoidable and unavoidable food waste. And when we talk about composting, we like to encourage people to reduce their food waste in the first place. Like it's great that if you've got wasted food that it's composted, but if you can reduce how much you're wasting in the first place, then that can really make a difference as well. So avoidable and unavoidable food waste. For example, I've got my mandarin here. I will take off the sticker. <laughs> because plastic's not very good for composting. Um, so what's inside here, if, if we didn't eat that and it went yucky and moldy, that's avoidable. Like we could have eaten it before it went off. Uh, whereas the peel is unavoidable food waste in that you don't eat the peel, it's gonna be left over. Um, whilst there are other uses, I'm going to do a trial. I've seen some um, fire lighters being made from citrus. Like there are other uses for them, but that's unavoidable, unavoidable versus avoidable. So same with the banana, you know, the peel is the unavoidable food waste, um, but the banana inside, hopefully you're going to eat it and not waste it. So, um, so the first step in the whole waste hierarchy is reducing the unavoidable food waste. And here, for example, um, this is just a dodgy, Mandarin, I'll hold it right up to the camera. It's all dry and shriveled. Probably still edible, but I would probably sooner use that. I might make marmalade out of that. I don't think I'll eat it. It's a bit, bit awful. Um, but the rest is good. So, um, so whatever you can reduce, that's that's fantastic. But obviously, you want to compost the rest. And if you do have a boo boo and a science experiment in the back of the fridge, we want to make sure we're composting that as well, rather than throwing it to landfill. Um, so in terms of choosing a system, um, we'll run through some of the different considerations because one of the most common questions I get is how do I know what system to get? How do I know what system works for me? Um, so the first real consideration would be, well, what are you throwing out? What is your main food waste? You know, or what is your main waste in general? Is most of your waste garden waste? Is it garden clippings, lawn clippings, leaves? Is most of your waste a waste, um, you know, like fatty off cuts of meat or eggshells, or is it mostly banana peels and, and veggie scraps and that sort of thing? Because the type of waste um, can really help you determine which system is best. For example, if you've got a lot of meat waste or animal based waste, um, generally a Bakashi system is going to be the best system for you because unless you're a really experienced composter, I wouldn't recommend putting those ingredients into a traditional compost bin or worm farm because it's just too easy to get it wrong. Uh, if you're a very experienced composter, you can compost anything. <laughs> but um, it, it takes a lot of time to really get that balance right. So um, choosing a system based on what your main types of waste are. So have a think about what you're throwing out in your kitchen. And we'll talk about what... Um, you know, what, what system might suit you best. Uh, of course, another consideration is your lifestyle, time, whether or not you've got kids. So people with kids will often get a worm farm because kids and worm farms go well together. Um, as you can see here, I get my little one involved in Bakashi. Um, but in terms of lifestyle, um, not that people are traveling much at the moment, but if you travel a lot, a worm farm might not suit you because you're not there to look after the worms. Um, so you might want a, a system like Bakashi that you can stop and start or a compost heap or a compost bin that you can just let go. Of course, budget is another factor. Um, you can, you know, spend, gosh, I've got systems here that are sort of upwards of $400 um, and systems that are, you know, $30. So <laughs> there are lots of different systems out there. Um, so your budget will often determine what you want as well. Um, pet poo is another consideration. Uh, a lot of people do want a system for pet poo. I will cover a bit about pet poo later on. Um, but if you are wanting to compost pet poo, um, I'd be thinking about maybe having a separate system, uh, in which case maybe don't have two of the same. So don't have two compost bins, but have maybe a compost bin and a worm farm or a worm farm and a bakashi or something like that. So complementing your systems so that across all of them, you have really good coverage. There's a drug behind me croaking, it's so cute. You probably can't hear it because I've got the filter on. Um, another consideration, of course, is your garden size or space available. 
a lot of people, we sell a lot of compost systems to people that live in apartments and just have a balcony. So some systems are really well designed just for balconies um, and other systems require quite a big garden. So you'll see behind me, you won't see behind me because I'm not sharing my screen. I'll just spotlight a different video. Hopefully that's just spotlighted, hang on. Not working because I'm sharing a screen. I'll stop sharing. All right, it should now be spotlighting. Um, behind me I've got a compost bin, a cage. Which way do I need to lean? <laughs> Like this cage here, you would need obviously quite a large garden, so this is good for really bulky stuff, as is a bin like this. Whereas if you're just on a balcony, something like a worm farm here, or a trashy bin, is probably a better size. Also, if you have a small garden, I've just got to find myself again to spotlight it. Oh, there we go. I've got both spotlighted. Beautiful. Um, this is another system that would uh, be good for really small gardens. So this is just an in-ground system and you can make things like this as well. You don't even have to buy ones. So there's lots of different systems out there that will help you um, basically compost, but it will suit your garden. So I'm just going to flip through my slides to get back up to where I was up to, because I'm going to use a different system now. The technology. Okay, so I'll just share that. Okay, so hopefully you can all see that now. Um, so I've got a What Waste Wear fact sheet that runs through different types of food waste um, that helps you then decide which system suits you best. So just to give you a bit of an overview of the systems and what suits what, uh, I would recommend if you've got a lot of veggie waste, uh, a worm farm would be your best bet. If you've got a lot of meat waste, mixed waste, cooked waste, uh, animal waste, like animal based, like, you know, milk, dairy products, stuff like that, then a Bakashi system would suit you best. And I'll go through how these all work differently in a moment. And if you've got a lot of garden waste and bulky stuff and you need that real estate, then a compost system would suit you best. So, what most people find is a combination of two systems will pretty much cover all of their, uh, you know, wastes produced. So, just bring all my pictures up. Do, 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 do. <laughs> um, so, you can make or buy systems. There are lots and lots of systems out there on the market. I'm assuming most people uh, here today are part of the Maribyrnong community, given that we were going to be out in Maidstone today before lockdown. Um, so through City of Maribyrnong, you can actually get a discount on compost systems through the compost community program. So I'll give you all the details of that at the end. So if you don't have the time or the materials or the resources to make something from scratch, then um, you can just buy something ready to go and uh, yeah, it's, it's good to go. So up here on the screen, I've got a few different systems um, for you to see. I've got a worm farm and I'll show you how to set up a worm farm in a few minutes. Tumbler, which I can show you shortly. Oh, it's a couple of tumblers up on the screen. Um, there's a couple of in-ground systems. They're all very similar. Um, so the Enso Pet, just to give you an idea of size, um, that's one of four panels that just snap together. Um, this is another in-ground system, the worm buffet, again, just to give you an idea of the size. Um, so they're really good if you, you know, in a unit or a courtyard sort of size garden or in a larger garden to have a lot of them in a row. Of course, the Bakashi bin, which you can see behind me. Yep. 
Uh, compost bin, I've got one behind me here. And what else? The subpod, which um, is a fairly new product on the market. I forgot to bring my scissors out, but I've got the subpod mini here as well that I can show you later on. Um, and that's not the extent of everything out there. It's um, just gives you a good overview of above ground worm farming, in ground worm farming, in ground bakashi, above ground bakashi, and composting. <laughs> There's um, a real mix. But of course, if you want to make make your own, then um, you know, using the principles that you're going to learn today, you can really make it from anything. Just a few considerations. Um, obviously, when it comes to toxins, uh, I'm really keen on the idea of using tires, but I probably would grow ornamentals and not food with the compost that comes out of there, unless I knew where the tires were from. Um, some tire, you know, it just depends. The, if they've been used on the road, they might have picked up a lot of, you know, over the years, heavy metals and things like that, if they're particularly old tyres. Um, just think about where things have come from and what they might include. Same with the picture below the tyres. You can see there the um, sort of it's not like an old screen door or something that's been cut up, wooden screen door. Um, I would just be careful maybe not to use one with lead paint. Um, so just Think about the materials that you use to have the least impact. Um, up in the top right, you'll see um, just pallets being used. You can get pallets that are either hardwood or treated pine. So I'd probably try to get the hardwood ones if I'm going to be having it in contact with soil, just so that it's not leaching anything. And of course, just having a pile works as well. Uh, so what about worms? Now, if you are Having a worm farm, either above ground or below ground, then of course you will need worms. Can you just grab worms from your garden? It depends. So there are about 8,000 species of worms, I think, so far identified in the world. Uh, and there are only three species that we use in composting down in Melbourne. Um, so well suited to climate and uh, the environment of, of composting. Um, so, I personally wouldn't add worms to a compost system. Compost ideally will run a lot hotter than a worm farm. So, if you add worms to a compost system that's running well, it's not good conditions for the worms and they'll nick off. If your compost bin is running cold, and generally they will always be running cold, um, unless you've got a really big pile. <laughs> Um, then worms, the right sort of worms will just move in if the conditions suit them. So I wouldn't worry about adding extra worms. Uh, I'll teach you some tips to speed up your compost without having to add extra things like worms um, just through your mixed ingredients. But if you're worm farming, of course, then of course you need to add worms. You do need composting worms, which you can either buy with your system or if you're lucky enough to have someone nearby that's got a very populous worm farm, they might may be willing to give you a whole heap. Generally, you will start with a thousand worms. How do we know that we're giving you a thousand worms? Do we count them? Not anymore. <laughs> um, initially, we've obviously had to, but a thousand worms weigh, depending on the size of them, weighs between 200 and 250 grams. So, um, so we'll separate out worms from, the, from their bedding or from their worm farm. 250 grams worth, then we'll put them in a heap more bedding so that they travel well. Uh, and then they, they've usually got about a month's worth of food with them when they arrive. So where a lot of people come undone is they feed them too much too soon, keeping in mind that they've still got a lot of food. Um, worms will eat half their body weight a day. So 250 grams of worms will eat 125 grams of food a day. Now, when you first get them, that's, what's that, a quarter of a cup? Half a cup, cups, no, it's about uh, 250, it's about half, half a cup. Um, the food is more than ample when you first start. There is a lag effect. So worms will actually not eat the fresh food while it's all there and fresh. They will eat it once it starts decomposing. So there, that food, when you first add it, will sit in the worm farm for at least a few days, if not a week. 
before the worms actually go, oh, hang on, it's ready. You know, it's like a cake, it's not ready yet, can't eat it yet. Um, so they will wait a little while. So in terms of how much you feed them, if you were to go and put in an ice cream container full of food the first day and then the second day and then the third day, there's much more food than the worms can eat and that's basically just going to rot. Now, once food in a worm farm rots, because it's gone past the point of worms wanting to eat it, it will become quite rancid. Um, the worms will find it very toxic and they, even though it's a contained system, the worms will find a way to get out. Um, they'll just leave or they'll die. So just keep that in mind when you're starting out with worm farming. Start out slow and just build up gradually and that way you'll have a really bumper worm farm. Um, in terms of their population, they will double their population depending on the worms, depending on the conditions. As much as monthly, they can double their population. Um, as a general rule, we say every three months. Um, so we'll take the average <laughs> to every two months. You could double how much you feed them because every two months, hopefully their population has doubled. So um, after two months, instead of feeding them half a cup a day, feeding them a cup a day, after another two months, feeding them cups, so two cups a day, another two months, four cups a day, then eight cups a day, uh, and so on and so forth. So it's quite exponential. Um, it sounds like you're giving them such a little amount to begin with, but you look at it, it's not just going up by half a cup each week, it's doubling each week. So once you're doubling 10 cups of food to 20 cups of food, um, it's a lot of food that they can eat. So the bigger systems, obviously there's more room for more worms and the more worms you'll end up with. Um, they will regulate their population based on the available food and the available space. So um, you'll never end up with too, too many worms. Um, if you do, you're very lucky and please share your secret. <laughs> So, um, yeah, they will regulate their population based on the space and the food available. Um, so I'll skip the rest of the worm maths, but there is a, for those of you that are homeschooling this week, um, there is a worm maths sheet up on the website that you can download for get the kids to do, but it's good to do yourself because you can work out if you started worm farming now, how many worms you might have by Christmas and how much of your Christmas food waste you can recycle in a day or in a week. Um, in terms of keeping the worms alive too, and I'll cover this more shortly, but um, just a couple of tips on keeping your worms alive, uh, not feeding them too much, not feeding them things that can kill them. So for example, pet waste, if the pets have just been wormed, or horse poo or sheep poo, if the horse or sheep have just been wormed, um, and not cooking them in summer. Uh, and the, my best tip for not cooking them in summer is to freeze some of your food scraps and keep them in the freezer uh, until the next heat wave and then pop them in the worm farm and the worms will regulate their temperature by moving towards or away from them. So, looking at the fundamentals of worm farming, first of all is aliveness. It's a living system. I'm just going to open up this worm farm and see what critters I can see. I'm not going to pick up spiders though. <laughs> I left the lid off this last night, <laughs> accidentally. Um, there's not a lot in there at the moment, except for worms. Well, the worms luckily didn't escape. Um, when it's raining, worms will, by nature, have the, uh, I don't really think about it, it's more the instinct that they will move up to the surface because they're concerned about drowning if, the ground floods because they don't know they're in a worm farm they'll just move up into the lid uh, and same with when it's really hot they'll dig to what they think is deep underground but they'll end up down in the liquid tray so just keep that in mind but in terms of aliveness I've just got a little worm here hard to see it's quite small um, it, this one would be a teenager about like year eight <laughs> level 
<laughs> um, but you'll get all sorts of other creatures in your worm farm. Um, a lot of spiders, um, sladers, I get a lot of sladers, I get earwigs. Um, when I'm really lucky, I get black soldier fly larvae. So you get all sorts of critters in there. Um, same as a compost bin, you will get all sorts of critters in your compost bin. Um, very similar to what you get in a worm farm and you probably find worms will move into your compost bin. As for the Kashi system, it's a good system. So worm farming and composting, you know, you sort of, you think about soil and everything that goes on in the soil and all the insects and things that are in the soil um, and it's something quite familiar to us. The Kashi um, is, so, it, it's kind of, different in that it's a real, it's a living system, but in a microscopic way. So what a Bikashi bin is, it's a bucket. You get a bucket like this and you add, add your food waste and then you add an activator, which essentially just, I'm just going to put worms down there, which just ferments the waste. So this here is a powder impregnated with 80 different microbes that are in a dormant state. So Molasses is fermented and then all the beautiful yeasts and lactobacillus and all those other um, beautiful microbes um, are isolated off that uh, and put onto a grain which is then fermented for another two months and then completely dried and it sits in a dormant state with a life of about two to three years. So it's pretty cool. Um, and so you're adding that to your food waste in a bakashi bin and it's fermenting all the waste in the bakashi bin. So rather than composting where it starts decomposing right away in a bakashi bin, it's actually being preserved rather than decomposing. So it's not composting in a bakashi bin. Um, but the living system or what's going on in there is all these microbes, once they're introduced to liquid, come to life. Think, think sort of sea monkeys from when you're a young kid. <laughs> um, and all these 80 microbes are amazing. You'll get um, some beautiful fungi growing, um, yeasts, all sorts of probiotics. Um, so there's an amazing transformation going on in the bucket. It's just that apart from the white mold, you won't be able to see it. So um, keep in mind that it is a living system and we need to embrace the fact that it's living um, and choose kind of the right location for it, which I'll talk about in a minute when we talk about temperature. Um, so, yes, you won't see much in there. If something goes wrong, so if your system goes a bit off, um, bugs might be able to find their way in, um, but hopefully hopefully they don't because hopefully it's just fermenting nicely. Um, so that's aliveness. Now diversity, diversity of ingredients um, really comes down to what you're adding. Now I think this is where those of you that had the questions early on, I think this is where you'll be able to tweak your ingredients to overcome some of those issues. So I will, I might unshare for a sec, just so it's not so, um, sorry, just so that it's not so hard to see what I'm holding up. So in terms of diversity of ingredients, what have I got here? We categorize our ingredients as greens and browns. Now each system needs a slightly different uh, set of ingredients. A Bakashi system, for example, um, you don't really need to add browns. So whilst Bakashi is, sorry, whilst composting and worm farming, you need your wet and dry ingredients, which we classify as green and brown or carbon rich, sorry, nitrogen rich and carbon rich. Um, what are some of the other classifications? Wet and dry. So we just group them into two groups. Think a bit like making a cake. You've got your dry ingredients and your wet ingredients. Um, so your green ingredients aren't always green. Uh, this is a green ingredient. Um, so the, the features of green ingredients is they're generally wet, they're generally nitrogen rich, and they're generally not brown, <laughs> um, with some exceptions. So Really, most of your food waste would be considered a green, uh, with a few exceptions. I would probably call an eggshell a brown. Um, and a bakashi bin, it can just run wet 
full of greens because a festering fermenting mess is kind of what you want going on in there. It's it's kind of like a casserole. So um, any of that stuff can go in there, but you don't really need to offset it like you do worm farming and composting because you're adding that activator, that powder activator. Um, I've also got a liquid activator I just made up yesterday from fermented molasses um, and essential microbes. So um, you can use a liquid as well. Uh, the liquid is a bit like a SCOBY, you just need to keep it alive. So if you have any experience with fermenting, um, you can have a lot of fun with even trying to make your own Bakashi activator so that you don't have to buy any. Um, but with the liquid one, you need to keep it alive because it's not in a dormant state, it's in a living state. And once it runs out of food, that's when things will go wrong. So that's where people might be going wrong with their Bakashi is you might, if you're getting black mold or green mold, you might not be adding enough activator or it might be a bit dry. So all those beautiful microbes aren't moving around as much in a really anaerobic environment. So if there's all little pockets of air and things that gives mold the chance to grow. Whereas if you run it quite wet, uh, it really can ferment a lot better. Think, think like a casserole that's got that beautiful, nice, moist level and no kind of pockets of air all through it versus you run it a bit dry, it's on the stove and it just keeps drying out and there's pockets of air and the meat's burning. Um, run it more like a bit of a wet casserole. That gives the microbes every chance to uh, increase their population really quickly uh, and spread right through and start fermenting before things rot. The next thing or the only other thing really that can go wrong other than not adding enough or not adding the right type of um, activator. So if you've bought a liquid off the shelf, um, it's not going to work. <laughs> it, unless it's just been put on the shelf that day um, and it's been made up fresh, it's, it's not going to work. Um, I've tried a lot of different ones on the market and this is why I make my own fresh now because every two weeks I feed it more molasses to keep it alive. Unless someone's feeding that stuff on the shelf and there's a date on it, a manufacture date and a use by date and everything else, um, it's just not going to work. So maybe you're using uh, an ineffective micro microorganism mix, maybe you're not adding enough. And the other op the other issue that can go wrong is um, what happened to me recently is I forgot about one of my bakashi bins because I have many <laughs> and it, it ran out of food. So um, in the, the microbes, they ran out of things to eat. It was all fermented. And so once that happened, the microbes, microbes stopped growing, the microbes then died and the content started to rot. So, and then of course you get the smell and everything else. So everything you don't want to happen in a Bakashi bin. Um, I guarantee I've made the mistakes and many other people have as well. Um, so what you need to do is make sure you empty it. So if you go on a holiday um, or if you, <laughs> wouldn't that be nice in a world of COVID? But if you are getting away um, or for some reason just can't be looking after your Bakashi bin, just empty it and rinse it out before you go and leave it empty. Um, but what we sell a lot of Bakashi bins to people in tiny homes, like the car like caravanning and you know mobile tiny homes and that sort of thing, because it is such a mobile system that you can take with you. Um, I always take one camping with me. Um, so yes, but if you're leaving it, abandoning it for a while, um, just empty it out. Either tip it into your compost bin if you've got a compost bin, or dig a hole in the ground and tip the contents in and bury it and rinse out your bucket and just leave it empty. If you have a liquid, um, just be willing to part with the liquid if you're going to be gone for more than two weeks unless someone can feed it. Um, but the grain, the shelf life's really long. Just keep the grain. I tend to store mine, I take it out of the bags and store it in a glass jar uh, because rodents love this and they will find a way. Even though it's generally um, the rich carbon mix um, I try to get one that's a sawdust based because it's a little bit less enticing for rodents than the grain mixes. Um, but the grain mixes are great because they've got the carbohydrates in them. Um, so yeah, just think about where you're going to store your grain as well. So that's in terms of your, your greens and that's really the only brown you need to add to your bakashi. 
Um, but you can add other browns. Um, coffee grounds sometimes fall under both categories, but I'd call them green because they're very rich in nitrogen. But eggshells are fine. Um, eggshells, I'll just take a note of eggshells. A lot of people say to me, oh, you know, I'm really worried that eggshells aren't breaking down in my compost system. Um, I think if Mother Nature designed them to break down in a week, we probably wouldn't even have eggs, nothing would ever hatch. <laughs> um, but Mother Nature's designed things so that they are slow release nutrients into the soil. Um, what, what we want to see is over a hundred year period, gradually little bits of calcium are just leaching into the soil. Uh, rather than that just happening in a day, breaking down in a day. Uh, it's actually good. That's nature's design. So we have this, you know, go, go, go kind of lifestyle where we just want everything instantly. Um, but that's not how nature's designed. So um, it's fine to have when you're harvesting, emptying your bakashi bin, which will still look like normal food when you harvest it, when you empty it into the garden. Um, and that's fine. But when you empty out your worm farm or your compost bin, absolutely fine to see things like eggshells in amongst it and bones, animal bones, especially in my bakashi bin. Um, that's absolutely fine. So that's what happens in nature. If a bird dies, you know, it's its bones end up in the soil, pardon me, in the soil. And that's, um, you know, that's just slow release for fertilizer. So um, in terms of greens and browns for your compost bin and for your Worm farm, um, you've got obviously all your food scraps. Now worms don't like it too acidic, and I'll talk about pH in a minute. Um, and most veggie scraps um, have a fair amount of uh, different acids in there, like natural acids. Um, so it will become slightly acidic. Uh, so neutral seven, Worms like it about seven to 7.5, but you'll probably find a lot of compost bins and worm farms, depending on how much food scraps, veggie scraps, probably get to around about maybe 6.5. Any more than that, it's probably getting a bit too acidic. Um, so you can get yourself a pH meter to check, um, but you'll usually be able to tell just by how the system's working. So the issues, and I know someone was having this issue with their tumbler, is just getting that balance of the greens and browns right. Um, in terms of browns, in case there's any beginners here, um, here's just some examples of browns. So your greens are your, your fruit and veggie scraps. Browns are usually garden scraps. Um, they're generally made from wood. So paper, for example, and cardboard. This is my favorite type of cardboard, the corrugated cardboard. In a worm farm, this will soak up moisture so it will help balance your moisture if it's too wet. Uh, and the worms will actually go into all these little bits and breed. So you'll find uh, inside a worm farm, and in fact, I can even grab a bit and show you in a minute. Um, they will be in there breeding, growing, um, eating carbon. So the carbon that offsets the acidity of things like your tomato, um, because this is more on the alkaline side. So your, you'll be able to balance your pH and your moisture just by varying your ratio of these two types of ingredients. So I tend to use browns, uh, tweaking my browns up and down as my, I guess, antidote to anything going wrong. Um, and we'll look at that as we go through a few more of the fundamentals. Um, but just in terms of browns, not all browns are created equal. I will focus mostly on cardboard and paper because there's, I get so many questions on it. So I get questions about shiny paper and I would just say no. Put that in recycling, anything that's shiny, um, that's sort of laser printed, potentially coated in plastic, um, I would just put straight into the recycling. Um, that includes things like it's a tooth, toothpaste cardboard. It's not corrugated. It's heavily printed on one side, even though it's brown on the other. Um, again, I would put that in the recycling rather than the worm farm or compost bin um, and just really save the corrugated cardboard with the exception of da -da -da, ones that's printed on the back. 
Um, so this one's off a box that was completely printed all over, lots of color, very shiny. There's generally gonna be quite a lot of synthetic inks, dyes, coatings on this kind of cardboard. I would keep it to just cardboard that looks like that on both sides. Um, and then you're safe. Uh, same with, oh, people um, ask me a lot about newspaper as well. They worry about newspaper. That's another example of one that's printed. Um, you know, it's only good on one side. You can rip it open, but that's a bit of a pain. So best just to recycle it. Uh, I do get asked about printed paper like newspaper. Um, I personally don't have a huge problem putting in newspaper. Uh, because it tends to be sort of fairly water-based inks, fairly inert, not a lot of coatings, whereas laser printed um, newsletter like this one, um, it's very shiny. The inks used in laser printing are synthetic. Um, so yeah, I don't think, I wouldn't be comfortable putting that in my compost personally. Uh, whereas the envelope itself, very minimal paint, uh, printing uh, and even though it's chlorine bleached, you know, it's it's a fairly small amount in the whole scheme of things, so that's probably okay. Uh, and then the other consideration I had when I was grabbing my materials for today, because I get asked about window envelopes, um, is for anyone with kids, we have a lot of painting <laughs> and we use any any old paper for painting, like envelopes. Um, but acrylic paint, if you look up acrylic on the internet, it is basically plastic. So again, that's something I'd err on the side of probably recycling rather than composting because of the plastics in the paint. So that is greens and browns in a nutshell. I'll just reshare my screen. Did we have any questions about greens and browns before I move on to the next letter in our acronym of Adam? Hit the space bar maybe and just chime in. No? Okay, that's right. If you do have questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. Uh, we will get to them at the end. So the next letter in our acronym, Adam, is AIR. Now this is an interesting one because again, it's different for different systems. So first of all, for the car sheet, um, we're wanting a system fairly devoid of AIR. Um, the microbes, the 80 microbes that are in this Bokashi mix, um, they were isolated, a scientist, a horticultural scientist in Japan isolated them in gosh, about 1974. And what he discovered was these microbes, they do well in an oxygenated environment. And then when you put them in an unoxygenated environment, known as an anaerobic environment, they did even better. So if there's some oxygen or air in your Bokashi bin, it's not the end of the world, but you're gonna get better and quicker results if you get all that air out. How do you get the air out? Just squish it down with a potato masher or just run it wet. When I rinse out my um, coffee grinds of the morning from the pot, um, I just tip the whole lot in. So I'm adding a bit of liquid along with my coffee grinds and all my food waste and that sort of thing. Um, so once there's liquid in there, obviously air kind of, you know, it fills in the air pockets and you don't get a lot of air and you get faster results. So we refer to Bakashi as an anaerobic system because it performs perfectly without air. A worm farm on the other hand, uh, and a compost bin is an aerobic system, meaning it needs oxygen for all the right bacteria to do their job. So it uses a different set of bacteria to break things down. Are you, I'm just noticing on my screen that my other screen's not highlighting. Can you all see my other, uh, the screen just with the compost bin in it? Can someone just hit space bar and let me know? Hi Ella, yeah, I can, I can see it. It's in a small screen beside you, so yeah. Oh, beautiful. Okay, great. No worries. So um, is it big enough for me to demonstrate or do I need to spotlight it? Uh, it might be better if it was slightly larger. It's just the same size as, of, as all of our um, individual boxes. So quite small at the moment, yeah. What I'll do is I will just replace spotlight. Okay, so I'll head on over here. 
Oh, now I've just got another notification. So here, this compost bin. This has got nothing in it. This is just for demonstration purposes, but I'll show you another one shortly. Oh, so for everyone, I just realised that if I clicked my view and put it on speaker view, it made it much larger. So it's probably an individual setting, Ella, but if everyone wants to do that, you just click view in the top right hand corner. Um, okay, and then you can yes. Get, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. If you pop it on speaker view, it lets me override um, so that just my screens are really big on your screen. Uh, and when I'm sharing my screen, your what you'll see is my shared screen with just the little box just with me in it. So, um, oh, technology. <laughs> it's great, but thanks for getting alerted. <laughs> so, in terms of aerating your compost system, it, there's a lot of different ways to do it depending on your system. So, what we would have seen at Maidstone Community Garden, I'll just lean down so my head's not chopped off. Um, at Maidstone, where we were going to run this today, um, there's really big compost bays that we would have looked at and from memory there might be some pipes down in the middle. So what that's doing is allowing oxygen to get right down into the middle of the compost heap. Um, in a system like this, it's a lot smaller and so you just don't have the real estate to be able to do something like that. So um, you can use a tool, whether you use a garden fork or um, just a metal pile, just something that you can get down with the air. This is basically a corkscrew shape, it's hard to see. <laughs> um, and you can just wind it down, wind it down a bit like you're removing. Um, what you find is the compost gets really heavy and compacted, so you won't be able to just wind all the way to the bottom and pull up unless you're the incredible hole. Um, I tend to just chip down about 10 centimetres at a time, bring it up and then go a bit further and then bring it up and then a bit further and bring it up. So just kind of stage it through. Um, otherwise, it's just too heavy to lift. So that is how you can get air into a compost system. There are lots of other ways as well, but um, I'm going to focus on that for now. Uh, having a little bit of trouble hearing you, sorry, Ella. Yeah, sorry. Um, I'll talk really loudly because the sound's actually getting picked up just over here. Oh, yeah. Can you hear it now? Yes, yeah, all good. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you see here, this is really light and fluffy. This is what you want in a worm farm. If your worm farm's very wet, it will actually um, shout all the air bubbles and you want the air bubbles in there. I'm going to um, change my view over to the other computer so that I can talk without yelling. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so in terms of aerating a worm farm, I tend to just get in there and just fluff it with my hands. Um, so you could see as I picked that up, it was beautiful, light and fluffy. Um, you know, you can see here, it's sort of, it's fluffy without being dry and crumbly. And I'll show you in a minute when we look at moisture, uh, just an example of what we do. So you're really just getting in with your gloves. I recommend wearing gloves just from a hygiene perspective, but also safety, um, spiders and things might move in. Um, the more you disturb your worm farm, the less spiders you're going to have. So. Um, if you're kind of in there every day, you're not going to have redbacks really moving in a hurry. But if you only visit it once every few weeks, the redbacks will be like, oh, this is a fairly peaceful place to live. I'll move in, you know. <laughs> they just don't like disturbance. So, um, yeah, just get in there all the time and they won't move in. Um, I'm just going to share my screen again so I don't go too far off tangent. Um, so, so, yeah, in terms of air, so what goes wrong with a lot of worm farms is they become very wet and compacted. Where people store them, um, maybe under a shady tree, uh, you know, they still get the rain. And depending on the angle of the rain, they can still flood. So what happens, the wetter it is, the more it compresses down, 
and then the more air you lose and the more issues you have. So you want to be managing the moisture along with the air. Sorry, I'm just moving things around. <laughs> okay, move this over here. Okay, um, so in terms of moisture, again, the three systems, they're all a bit different. Um, so Bakashi, as I mentioned, I personally like to run mine really wet. I did just empty my Festi Bakashi into the compost before, the one that was forgotten. Um, and it was still really wet, which did help it last a lot longer. <laughs> but um, yeah, if you run it dry, you'll just find that um, things might rot before the microbes can get in and actually start to preserve, preserve, bleh, preserve them. And um, with compost and uh, worm farm, they're both more similar. I'll grab a handful and show you. Okay, so this, I've just grabbed a handful of the castings and pushed it into a ball and you can see how it's holding its shape. Not falling apart. That is absolutely perfect moisture level. What you want is to be able to squeeze it and not really have liquid drip out or just a few drips running down. If you squeeze it and it's muddy and there's heaps of water running down your hands, um, it's too wet, or if you try to roll it into a ball and it won't hold a shape that you can hold it with two fingers like that and it just crumbles, it's too dry. So getting that moisture right and composting is the same. If your compost is about that moisture level, then it's going to be perfect. It means you've got your balance of greens and browns right, things are breaking down right. Um, if it's too wet, that's where I bring in my favourite, oh, I've lost it, my cardboard. <laughs> The corrugated cardboard I love to use when things are too wet because it's just so beautiful at soaking up excess moisture. And if it's too dry, um, I don't water a worm farm. I'll occasionally water a compost bin. But what I'd rather do is add some wet ingredients. Now, you could, if you, you know, got a local cafe or something and you can get a heap of food scraps, then fabulous. But if not, um, then wet that cardboard. So you can add the cardboard wet. And basically you're adding moisture without washing all your good stuff through and without um, adding all the acidic ingredients that are going to throw out your pH. So cardboard's kind of a bit of a miracle ingredient in that respect. So that's just something to consider. Um, but I'll, when we do troubleshooting, I'll show you a few other dries that you can add as well. Okay. Um, in terms of amount, I did cover this with worms a bit earlier about how much to feed them. So worms are really the only ones you need to be really strict about the amount of food just because you don't want to overfeed them. If you went and put a whole heap, like you know, six bucket loads of food scraps from your local cafe in your compost bin or your compost heap, that's fine provided you manage it. So by putting in six buckets worth of food scraps, it's going to be a lot of greens. It's going to be very wet. It's going to be very acidic. So balance it. Chuck in some browns, whether that's some shredded cardboard, some gra uh, dry grass clippings, like dry grass, like this, um, this kind of dry, um, anything like that, just to counteract that moisture is really going to help you. So you're wanting to balance your moisture and your acidity and you're wanting to get your air in there because as that stuff starts to heat up and break down, um, it can rot if the wrong bacteria take hold. So just get in there with your aerator and turn it and turn it and really stay on top of it for those first week or two um, just because it's yeah quite a big shock to the compost bin system to have that much greens added at once. Um, but once you've got a really big system and it's just going gangbusters, um, so forgiving, you can just keep adding so much stuff and just make sure you mix it in, turn it over. Um, I don't recommend to people to put in layers. Um, a lot of composters will recommend layering your greens and browns so that you're putting in the same amount of greens and the same amount of browns. I don't say that you layer it simply because 
you need to mix it together anyway. So it needs to get mixed up and people get a bit fixed on keeping it in layers. It doesn't need to be in layers. That layers is more just to remind you that you need ingredients from both categories. So just, um, yeah, mix it all in, whatever you're adding, um, just mix in something to counteract it. Think, think a bit like you're making a cake. You've just added a heap of eggs and butter and milk. You're gonna need to add some more flour. So just tweak your greens and browns. My preference in a compost system to be effective, um, and this for the person who's having trouble with their tumbler, um, is I go about two thirds green to one third browns, um, and then I'll just tweak it up and down as needed. So that's how I get the best sort of decomposition happening. If I have too much browns, I find the system's very slow. Uh, and too much greens and you can start to have issues with rotting. So it just sounds like with that system that's just gone a bit kind of gray uh, or brown, brown you said or gray, um, it might just be that ratio, just perfecting it a little bit. And then the other thing is you could add an activator. So just introducing in some beautiful microbes like adding a bit of Bokashi grain, just because the, the enzymes or the microbes in Bokashi will do okay in, and I have to break it up, an aerobic environment, um, that will do fine with air. So just, yeah, pop them in together. Um, and that will help if your system's having issues because you're just inoculating it with some really nice stuff. Um, you could also add, there's other ingredients you could add uh, like, a bit of blood and bone um, or dynamic lifter. The really high protein, high nitrogen mix can often really activate um, a system that's just gone a bit sluggish. Um, it might be a bit cold, which is why it's a bit sluggish as well. And a little bit of garden lime too, which I've got down here somewhere. Um, you can just sweeten it up a little bit as well, um, just to balance out the pH. So try a few of those things. Um, and see how you go. Whereas with a um, with a slow worm farm, I make up a um, a worm breeding booster. I call it worm phrodisiac because as soon as it's given to the worms, they tend to all just chuck their keys in a bowl and go at it. <laughs> so it's basically a really high protein mix, um, and it's just a powder. So I'll just sprinkle that in from time to time. Um, to really help activate them, get their breeding happening and speed it up, especially at the end of winter because everyone's a bit sluggish at the end of winter. I know I am. Um, so just to give them a bit of a boost to come into spring and get their population back up. Um, if, you're, if you don't have access to things like garden lime, you can buy um, like smaller containers. Hopefully you can all see my little screen here. Um, you can buy just little containers of what, what is essentially um, the same thing, it's garden lime, dolomite, that type of thing, um, but it's just in a smaller form, convenient form, so you don't have to have a big bag of lime in, in the shed. If you, you know, you might live in an apartment, you don't want a big bag of lime, <laughs> it'll take you 20 years to work through it. Um, and in terms of amount, uh, so we've done amount for compost, amount for worm farms, amount for your Bokashi bin, it really just comes down to the amount of how much Bokashi activator you add. Um, I, my recommendation, if you're using the dry, like the powder, whether it's a grain or a sawdust base, I would, every time I add like about two inches worth of food scraps, um, I would just sprinkle it on the top a bit like dusting icing sugar on the top of a sponge cake. So just give it a bit of a coating over the surface, just to inoculate the surface with those microbes. They will then breed and grow as soon as they hit the moisture. If you're using the liquid, um, or if you've made your own liquid, I just put in a bit of a splash, like a shot glass or two worth, a medicine cup. Um, just put in a bit of a splash. It's usually more potent. I make a really potent mix here. So you don't need much at all. And uh, as soon as that has access to all that amazing food in there, all those microbes grow like crazy. So, um, so just putting in enough of the mix. If you're using a really poor quality mix, you need a lot more. Um, so, especially if you're making your own grain or powder, it'll probably take you a while to just tweak it to get that beautiful 
concentrations. So you might find you need to add a bit more to begin with until you get it right. I would recommend when you first start out with a Bakashi, you're safer to add a bit too much than not enough, just until you're confident. And then you can just ease it off and you shouldn't have too many troubles. In terms of, uh, I, I should have said that um, there are two acronyms, are Adam and Ant, so easy to remember. <laughs> um, your, so your N in your Ant acronym is neutrality. So you're aiming for a system that's quite neutral, pH neutral, so clo as close to seven as possible. And you'll achieve that generally by tweaking your greens and your browns. Your browns are gonna help you bring it back to neutral from acid from all your veggie scraps. Um, and something that I keep handy, I'll just unshare for a sec. I've just got a bucket here. So whenever we empty the fireplace, I've just got a bucket of all the, um, sorry. keeping that handy, I just keep that in the shed. Um, so whenever I need to add a bit of, you know, just sort of something alkaline and I don't have garden lime handy, I can just add a handful of that and just sprinkle it a bit like salt and pepper on the top. And that will help balance out our pH as well. Um, so what you'll find a Bakashi system tends to be more acidic than a worm farm or a compost bin because it's, it's using different bacteria, different enzymes, different microbes um, to do the job than what's happening in the garden. So you're wanting your Bakashi, sorry, your compost or worm farm to be kind of similar to what you get in soil in the environment. Your Bakashi system will be more acidic Therefore, when you go to use it, and we'll talk about harvesting soon, when you go to use it, keep in mind that it's going to be a lot more potent um, and it could throw out the pH of your soil if you don't water it down. So um, just keep in mind that it is a more acidic mix. It's not going to burn you. Um, you know, it's, I don't think it's as acidic as, say, apple cider vinegar, but it's probably close um, because it's very similar method <laughs> as making apple cider vinegar. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, just keep that in mind. Apple cider vinegar is about a 5.5, I think, on the pH scale. Um, so it's a fair stretch from seven. Um, it doesn't sound like far, but it is. <laughs> um, and then our last, our last part of the acronym about a man is temperature. Um, now, temperature is really important because we want to keep everything alive. As we looked at the start of the acronyms, it's a living system. So the temperature that we want to keep our systems at um, varies according to the system. Bakashi and worm farms, generally just room temperature, whatever temperature it is, kind of just you've got to live with. Um, Bakashi, you just don't want it to be too hot because you don't want to kill, cook your enzymes. So if you put a tub of yogurt in the car and closed all the doors and windows and left it in the sun, that yogurt all the good stuff in that yogurt's going to be dead in no time. So um, just think about it a bit like yogurt. You, want to keep it alive um, and it'll the enzymes will obviously slow down the cooler it is so room temperature you're going to get the best performance out of it um, but you could store it in a cooler environment if needed worms they kind of like what we like so if I'm cold which I am <laughs> where I'm sitting today they will be cold um, and I'm just the two worms that I picked up earlier literally have not moved it's just laying there. Um, they very dormant when it's cold. Uh, in fact, I'm just going to sit him in this tomato, a little bit acidic. I say him, they're hermaphrodites. Um, but they're almost, think a bit like reptiles. They're almost sort of in a state of torbidity. So not a lot will happen in winter. I tend to back off my feeding a bit in winter and I add a lot more of the worm phrodisiac to give them a bit of a kick along so I've got um I've got my big worm breeding pits that we actually loaded up with forced manure not long ago which generates heat and that heat generated not enough to kill them but enough to keep them really active and so those pits are going gangbusters whereas my little worm farm behind me it's cold and they're just not doing anything <laughs> so um so in winter, you can put your worms in a slightly warmer spot. So you could put them in a spot that gets a bit of sun in winter. 
in summer though, even an hour of sun, once you're in those 30 plus degree days, is enough to kill your whole lot of worms. So an above ground worm farm is handy in that you can keep moving it around um, to where it suits you. Although I tend to just have, have it in a spot and just give it, give it some other love <laughs> with extra horse manure because um, I get a bit sick of moving them around. But um, yeah, basically you can move it in, to a cool position in summer so that they don't cook. Just think, think of your worms a bit like, you know, as pets or kids in a hot car, just don't have, have them in a situation where the sun's gonna be hitting them um, and where they get a nice cross breeze for cooling in summer. Uh, but in winter, yeah, a little bit of warmth certainly doesn't hurt keeping their population active. They won't do a lot of breeding if they're very cold. And these worms are also quite inactive because there hasn't been a lot of food in there. They're just in castings. So I've just brought them to show you today. Um, yeah, how it works. What I will show you later on and remind me if I don't, for those who want to know, is just how to set up a worm farm from the start. So using the layers. Um, so I'm teaching you the fundamentals here, but different systems work in different ways. So an in-ground system isn't in layers, everything's just all in together, whereas a layered worm farm has a few other things to be aware of. So I'll, I'll show you that. In fact, I'll probably show you that in maintenance and harvesting. Uh, temperature of your compost bin is the one exception to the kind of keep it cool rule. Uh, and that is if it's working as it should, it will be steaming. So it will be 60 degrees in the core and there'll be steam coming off the top. Uh, and that will be basically, um, yeah, just a really fast, happy system. But in a standard compost bin like the one behind me here, um, which you can't see because I'm in the way. <laughs> uh, so in a system like this one, it's just not big enough to generate that kind of heat. The only heat um, that I've managed to, the only systems I've managed to get really good heat into um, in a cage, um, I've managed to layer up the cage because they're quite a large capacity. Um, layered one up to run quite hot. And I've got the 400 litre on ground worm uh, compost bin that, um, that runs really hot, especially if I add a lot of horse poo. So horse poo is really good for kind of speeding up the system. Um, so in terms of your kind of medicine cabinet for troubleshooting, I've run through a lot of those other things already. I'm not 100% sure why I have avocado or watermelon on here other than um, to help your worms. They tend to be too, excuse my spelling of avocado. <laughs> that must have been late at night. Um, avocado. Uh, so basically avocado is really high in protein and it's not overly acidic. So it's a really good ingredient to get worms going a bit crazy. Um, how are you going? <laughs> Corey is just here picking up orders. Um, and watermelon is great if your worms are really slow and your system's really dry. I like freezing a bit of avocado and watermelon to add frozen in summer. That keeps things going. So they're just some handy ingredients to have. Um, on hand, but cardboard is always my go-to. Now I get asked a lot about pet poo. Um, I just got to keep moving my other screen around, so it's not in the way. <laughs> um, I won't go too much into pet poo um, because it's kind of a whole other presentation, but I just wanted to give you a bit of an overview because I do get asked about pet poo quite a lot. Um, so in terms of different pets, um, not all pet poo is created equal. Um, herbivore pet poo is obviously pretty easy to manage because it tends to carry a lot less pathogens and parasites. Um, so that might be, you know, poo from rabbits and guinea pigs, um, horses are herbivores. <laughs> um, so their poo is generally pretty good to use as well. Um, whereas, um, you know, dogs and cats, and uh, what else, even chickens. Um, there's a little bit more management, a few more risks associated. So um, just knowing what's in your pet poo to begin with. Um, and also pet litter. So if you're doing cats, um, you know, composting your cat's poo and your cat 
uses a litter tray and you need to empty the litter tray. I'll show you a slide shortly about some of the different litters, um, but just looking at the type of litter, because obviously not all pet litter is compostable. Um, what you'll find too with um, pet poo, depending on whether it's um, herbivore, omnivore, um, is that it might be quite dry and carbon rich, or it might be quite nitrogen rich. So dog poo, for example, is quite nitrogen rich and is a bit of a worm mecca. So unless your dog just been wormed, worms will go a bit crazy for dog poo. Um, it, it tends to have lots of things in it that the worms love, which sounds a bit disgusting, but it's true. Whereas if you're composting um, your, say, rabbit poo <laughs> and it's in hay, it's very dry system. It's very dry poo. Um, I would be adding that as a brown to your system. But in terms of risks, um, with your herbivore poos, I would add herbivore poo to any, any compost bin and then use it to grow food without a second thought. There are some bacteria and pathogens and parasites that could possibly transfer to humans, but very, very few and very unlikely, like it's not a huge risk. Whereas with your omnivore and carnivore poo, particularly your dogs and cats, they do carry a lot of other pathogens and parasites that can transfer to humans. Everything from ringworm to toxoplasmosis, which um, you know, uh, is really dangerous for pregnant women uh, and babies can cause birth defects and all sorts of things. So when it comes to cat and dog poo, my recommendations are having a separate system for that so that you're not using it on your food. And I'll show you a few other risk management things for those as well. Another question with pet poo, I get asked a lot about compostable bags, um, which you can see here, just got these ones here, these do break down really well, this particular brand. Um, but if you're putting in a whole heap of these, like, you know, a bag of pet poo in one of these every day, um, it's going to slow your system down. So if you can avoid using bags, then that's best because the bags will slow your system down. So just having a tool um, to pick things up is a much better option. So in terms of just managing risk, if you are composting pet poo, um, safe handling, obviously, wearing gloves, using tools, um, you know, that you're not then leaving that tool lying around for kids to pick up. Um, I prefer an in-ground system for dog and cat poo so that you're not having to handle it so much. It really minimises handling. So something like um, this in-ground system is good. Um, keeping it well away from your food growing. So I wouldn't set up my little in-ground system. I'll just stop sharing for a sec. I wouldn't set this up, say, right next to the veggie patch or right next to my fruit trees. Probably less of an issue for fruit trees than your veggie patch. Um, but I'd set this up more, you know, amongst the roses, something that you're not going to eat, um, just so that any pathogens and things that are in there aren't transferring over to your food system. And having an in-ground system, basically it's buried up to here. So you're just lifting the lid, chucking your food in, putting the, your food, your poo in, putting the lid back on if it's got worms in it, or if you're using bakashi instead of worms, because um, you can use this as a bakashi pet food system, sprinkling your bakashi, um, place the lid, and just next to no handling. So it's a much safer way to do it than in a system that needs some handling. Keeping it obviously well away from waterways, what you will find is um, if you live near, say you back onto Maribyrnong River, for example, um, what in pet poo has a lot of nutrients that causes algal blooms and is really contaminating to waterways. If you have runoff from your property that goes into a local drain or into a local creek, that will end up in the river and it will end up in Port Phillip Bay. So um, just keeping it well away from waterways. Um, putting it in a spot in your garden where it's all the nutrients are going to get used up by your plants rather than leave your property. If you are composting, uh, like in a compost bin or heap, um, dog or cat poo, only do it in a hot compost system. Uh, otherwise, it's the perfect environment for all those pathogens to just keep growing and spread uh, and potentially infecting you. So um, just do do that that way. I've just noticed my screen's dimmed a bit, so if it drops out, I'll swap to my other camera. <laughs> um, 
move my little this little window surely there's another way that they can do it so that it's not in the way there we go um and then in terms of keeping your worms alive so if you're using a worm farm type system um there's just a withholding period if you've wormed your cat or dog wormer also kills worms um so even ivermectin the the drop on you know the drops on the back of the neck um that's that kills all sorts of parasites it'll kill stuff if, like it, it'll still be in their poo when you compost their poo so just keep that in mind if you have wormed your pets um not to put that in with worms for a couple of weeks so withholding period i think is about 10 days for most dog and cat wormers but ivermectin based ones um but yeah it depends on on brand so maintenance and harvesting in terms of maintenance of your systems how are we going for time oh yeah we're good but i think we'll quite finish as early as i said but we'll come close um so there are lots of different systems so set and forget systems generally an in-ground system doesn't need a great deal of maintenance so again something like um this in-ground system here really every now and again maybe you'll want to go in with your spiral turner um but they're usually pretty self-sustaining because the worms can come and go as it suits them and if you're adding bakashi all the magic's just kind of happening because of all the soil microflora and microfauna <laughs> um, that's doing their thing um whereas with your worm farm and your compost bin they need a little bit more love um and your bakashi bin doesn't really need any any extra love <laughs> it doesn't really need any maintenance at all so um so i'll just focus first on maintenance of your compost and your worm farm and then um we'll look at harvesting of all the systems so i'm just going to remove this spotlight and add this spotlight and i'm just going to take this one across to the other unmute okay Don't mind me while I walk across. Okay. Hopefully you can all hear me. <laughs> um, so in terms of maintenance, oh, I didn't even bring the screw over. That's okay. Um, so you use your spiral screw tool. Um, and just basically turn it. What you want to do, I'll come closer so you can hear me. What you're wanting to do um, with your system like that, with your corkscrew, is you're just wanting to get air in there and turn things over. So you're wanting to mix your, um, your greens and your browns together and get air in there. Um, and that's basically it. That's all the maintenance that's needed in a compost system. Um, but while I'm over here to save running back and forth, I'll just quickly show you harvesting uh, and then we'll go back over to maintenance of the system over there. So in terms of harvesting, actually I'll stay close so that I'm not talking when I'm over there because there's a fair bit of background sound from the um, With maintenance, uh, sorry, with harvesting for your compost system, you just wanting to get those solids out and use them in the garden. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to lift the compost bin up off the mass um, and I'll, I'll role play because I don't actually have to harvest it at the moment. Um, but what you would do is you would actually just anything that still needs composting because obviously what's on the bottom is ready to go, but you'll probably still have a lot of stuff on top that needs more time in the compost bin. So you just get your shovel and shovel the top half back into the compost bin in the new spot or if you're moving it further away into a wheelbarrow and then into the new spot and then what's left is ready to go into your vegetable patch um so i i'll often recommend either keeping your setting up your compost bin um in a spot where you can just keep moving it side by side or right near your veggie patch where you can shovel stuff straight into the veggie patch and that just minimizes the amount of work so I'll just give you a quick demo of, of how it would look. Um, imagine there's a lot of stuff on top. There's only a little bit of um, bakashi on top from there. My rotten bakashi that I forgot about. <laughs> so 
So basically, just picked it up, put it beside. That white stuff on top is all the white mold and Bokashi Nata. Oh, it's a little bit smelly because I did let it rot. So um, that's fortunately with Bokashi, not much can go wrong. But when it does go wrong, you do exactly the same as when it goes right. And that is emptied into your compost or dig a hole and bury it, rinse it out and start again. So um, it's pretty forgiving in that respect. Um, but now that's in a compost environment, that'll that'll take off and compost beautifully. So, um, so basically, if there was still some stuff on top there that needed to be composted further, I would just shovel that across into the new spot. And then what's left in the bottom would go straight across into the veggie patch. I'm just going to put this back on though, because it's not ready for harvesting. And if I leave it off, grass is all going to go through it. <laughs> Okay, so we'll head back over so I can show you the worm farming. Hopefully you're not getting dizzy by my motion. Just change cameras. Okay, I'm just going to turn this one off so it's not too confusing. Okay. So, ah, okay, so that's a good question. Someone's just said, what about harvesting the compost bins with the vent or the door on the side? I'll just grab an example of what that means. So some compost bins will have a little door at the bottom, slides up. Um, you can, you can just slide the door up, stick a shovel in and shovel stuff out. But that's really hard. Um, they, these triangle shaped bins, uh, they're as sturdy as spaghetti bins. My battery's running low, so if it cuts out, I will quickly fire up my other screen. Um, I personally would give this a good wiggle like I did the other one, lift it up, hold in to the side and shovel in. So yeah, basically um, you can use the little vents on the side, but I find it too hard. So I just do it the same as I do with the round bins. Now the worm farm. I'll just do the harvesting. I will um, just show you the quick worm farm setup for a layered system because I do get a lot of questions about that. So the layered systems have a liquid tray at the bottom um, and a tap, which my tap's not in at the moment, but a tap goes there um, and a leg. Just go on there uh, and then three trays but depending on the brand some brands have less some brands have more uh, and the trays all have little holes in the bottom so we will refer to our layers by the following names it makes it easier to remember this is the basement this is where everyone parks their cars in the apartment but no one lives there usually this is the ground floor of the apartment block. This is the first floor of the apartment block. And then you get another one, pretend it's another one. <laughs> and then this is the penthouse. So we've got a three level apartment block plus a basement. So what we do when we first get our worms, see the trays are the same. So it doesn't matter which one you put in first. So you put your worms into the ground floor. So your bottommost tray with the holes in the bottom. Pop your worms in there. Worms will generally come in a heap of coarse manure. 
know if you can see these. These worms are a lot fatter than the other ones. A couple in there, but they're not very active because it's so cold. In summer, if I was doing this in summer, these little dudes would be flipping around everywhere. So, here's the bottom layer. And pop these on empty. And your lid. Keep the rain out, keep the worms in. Um, and then just let them just keep eating their food for a couple of days, or maybe just add just a tiny little bit just to be on the safe side to not overfeed them. And then when you start to add food, you want to add food to the ground floor where the worms are. So you're lifting off the top two trays and putting food down in the ground floor. I'll just tilt this down so you can see better. Add your food to there. You'll know when it's too full because when you start to put these trays in, if you feel like they're going to be sitting a bit high and unstable and wobbly, then you know that tray's full and then start adding to the next tray up, which is there. So then you're just lifting off a top tray with the lid, putting food in there. Eventually that will also be full and this will be sitting up a bit and then you start adding to the top tray. In theory, by the time you've added all your food to the top tray, your worm population should be pretty big. And in theory, the worms will have all moved up to eat all the food. Depending on what's still in the castings, um, sometimes I find I get a lot of worms still in the castings. Um, and so I need to separate them out for harvest. But if it's, if they've read, if the worms got the memo that they're meant to move up, it's really easy to harvest. Basically, um, you may get liquid off your worm farm. Um, mine, you can see, is not a very wet system. There's not really any liquid coming off at the moment. If I was to add a heap of stuff like, you know, this tomato and stuff, then it's going to probably have a bit of water because when this breaks down, water will come out. The liquid, worm wheat, worm juice. Um, whereas if I'm adding a lot of dry ingredients, and generally people say, oh, I don't add citrus, um, this isn't very acidic um, mandarin, I find I actually don't mind it. Um, so if I'm adding dry things like banana peels, when they break down, not a lot of liquid comes out of them. So you're not going to get a lot of liquid. So that's absolutely fine. Um, if you need to make some liquid and yours isn't producing liquid, don't pour water through. If you pour water through, you're basically washing out all your babies, you're washing out all your eggs. Um, so you just wiping out half your population um, and you're making your system very wet and prone to smell and other issues. So um, just keep in mind that, um, yeah, you don't need to pour water through. If you want some liquid and you don't have liquid, grab a handful of castings, put it in a bucket, mix it together, then decant it into the water and can. And it's exactly the same. It's just, you haven't wrecked your own farm doing it. So you're just creating a lot of work for yourself if you pour water through your worm farm um, because you really are impacting your population. So that's how you get your liquid. With um, these, obviously, you know, they're normally on legs. Um, I just keep a bucket or a little tin. Thank you. Okay, so it, you, you can just drop box the rest of it to me later. I'll merge them. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to persist with um, oh, I can use either one of these, but the phone's probably giving me a bit more control. So in terms of harvesting your um, actual solids from your worm farm, I'm oh, doing this one hand now. <laughs> um, as you saw earlier, we have all these beautiful solids. Now, these ones here, there's not a lot of worms in them. It's pretty much just all castings. So literally all you would have to do is empty this out into your veggie patch and it's good to go. If it was full of worms, if the worms just hadn't moved up to the rest of the food because there was still stuff they were eating, a few options. One is just be patient, wait longer. <laughs> but often you harvesting because you need the space as much as it is because you need the, um, the compost itself. Um, so a couple of ways you can do it. One is to bait them with something they really love. Pumpkin, watermelon or avocado are my go-tos. And what you can do is um, just put one of those in, like just cut in half, 
face down and the worms are all going to move into it. Um, give them a week to all move in and then scoop that and the worms out into your worm farm and then your castings will be fairly worm free. Not completely, but fairly. Um, your other option is you need a nice sunny day. I'll just get this up here so hopefully you can see a bit more. Um, what you can do. Okay. Um, basically, put the tray that you want empty on top. So I've just taken the ground floor and put it on top of the penthouse and the lid's off. And in a perfect world, it would be a nice sunny day. It would be warm and pleasant, but also the sunshine. Uh, worms instinctively will move away from the sunshine because they're nocturnal and birds will catch them and eat them if they're out during the day. So the worms will start to bury down away from the light. So all you have to do then is just have a bucket nearby. You know, maybe your phone um, with Facebook or the Sunday paper or whatever it is and just scrape off the top into your bucket until you start to see worms and then just wait a few minutes, have a sip of your tea uh, and give it a few more minutes and then do the same again. So just keep scraping off from the top and putting it into a bucket until you get to your worms and just spend a good half hour to an hour doing that and you'll end up with an empty tray on top. All your worms will have moved down into the former, the former penthouse because now you've got a new penthouse, it's empty, and they will um, basically, they will just, uh, you know, be the new residents in the next one down and you can empty it and start to fill it again. So that's harvesting for your worm farm. We have a car shit in. Um, Bakashi, the two parts of the Bakashi to think of. The first one is um, there's a tap. So the liquid that comes off um, is really, really potent. So think think like vodka, like it's super, super potent. You want to water it right down. Um, you would never put that on the garden neat. What is in this mix actually makes some amazing chemical reactions happen in the soil, including um if i think you're still spotlighted are you able to spotlight <laughs> sorry i realized i'm on mute um i'm not sure how to unspotlight myself but i did just want to say that there's a question from emma about her worm farm um, and making it uh, process more quickly i'm not sure if you've responded to this one and also that the um the best and easiest way to harvest castings it seems quite time consuming and difficult yes okay so in terms of um the first part of the question, yeah, so using the high protein mix, like we make up a worm for Adesiac here, um, you can use a bit of dynamic lifter or something similar. Um, that will really help boost the worms along. Um, Pip's camera's off now, but it's still showing you as highlighted. I thought um, shooting the camera off might help, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, so if you just mouse over the video of me talking, the mm -hmm. little three dots, like the menu, and it should just be replaced spotlight. Spotlight for everyone? Yes. Perfect. All right, it's just been easy for everyone to see. It's not little. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, yeah, so just um, decant your liquid off the bottom. Um, again, like with the worm farm, you won't always get liquid off the system. It just depends on how wet your system is. Um, but unlike a worm farm, you can add water to this system without doing too much damage. Um, I tend to add water like it's been sitting out overnight so all the chlorine's evaporated i tend not to um, use heavily chlorinated water in this because chlorine obviously kills all the good bacteria um so you take your your liquid off and just dilute it i would use um about 100 mils no about 10 mils to a liter of water like really dilute it down um what is going on in uh 
in this liquid and then when it is added to the soil is all these beautiful chemical reactions actually help to unlock a lot of nutrients in the soil that are otherwise locked into other compounds um and so suddenly all these nutrients are available it's a bit like adding a massive handful of fertilizer you can actually burn the plants um because there's suddenly all these nutrients available that weren't available before so um so it actually prevents the need to add fertilizers because this unlocks the natural um nutrients in the soil um but just yeah use it sparingly it's very very strong uh and then for the actual contents of the bucket which mine's just got paper and a thermometer in it now <laughs> is what you want to do uh is just empty that into your worm farm or your compost bin um Oh, it could be a bit acidic to your worm farm. I tend to just add a handful here and there into the worm farm. So mostly into the compost bin or in, dig a hole in your veggie patch. Um, I'll come back to that question at the end um, about the leachate in the worm farm. It popped up, but because I'm now on the mobile, um, it won't show, although I'll be able to see it on the computer in a minute. Um, so with the contents, um, the other thing, how, what's recommended to do is to dig a hole in the ground tip the solids in, cover them over, and within two weeks you can plant into it, but just give it two weeks for all that big surge of nutrients um, to settle before you plant into it. So, in terms of troubleshooting, so I can see the questions. So this question uh, from Kara says, I heard that liquid, oh, you're probably getting a bit of feedback. I'm just going to turn off the sound. Okay. Um, I heard that the liquid at the bottom of the worm bin is called leachate and that it is not good to use. For worm tea, you need to boil the castings to get tea. Is that correct? No, 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 no. Please don't boil your tea. Um, basically, the leachate at the bottom uh, is just all the liquid and nutrients that have come out of your food scraps. So if you were to squish a tomato, if you were to put that in a juicer, the liquid you get off it is going to be rich in all the nutrients that are in that. Um, I, I have heard of leachate not being good to use if certain if there's certain things used in your system. So for example, if you used a lot of horse manure that was very high in glyphosate, for example, um, which is Roundup basically, um, that would be an issue because you obviously have, you know, that chemical load in there. But, you know, if you're sort of eating fairly clean, that leachate's amazing. If you boil it, you're killing off all the good bacteria uh, in there. So yes, I would, I would never boil it. <laughs> um, the only other thing I could think of that someone would say something like that is perhaps, uh, oh, perhaps their worm farm was rancid and they had some other pathogens in there that they needed to boil. Maybe they had giardia or something in there. I don't know. So um, I think if you're running your worm farm properly, uh, you shouldn't end up with those kind of issues, so it shouldn't be a problem. Um, but some other troubleshooting issues that people might have um, are lots of little flies, uh, and you can get this in, in compost or in a worm farm. But you know those little flies, they fly in front of your face and they drive you crazy. Um, they will um, they will really take hold in a system that's very wet and they'll really take hold in a system that is quite acidic. So basically um, just managing your moisture content and managing your pH uh, will prevent them really taking hold. And if they do take hold, just go in and, and rectify that situation. You'll always get some, um, but just hopefully not in plague proportions. Once it's plague proportions, it's an indicator that something's wrong. Um, the, other, the other question I get a lot of for troubleshooting is, do how do you stop rodents in your systems? Um, now I can tell you that 
if a rodent wants to get into a system, it will find a way in. <laughs> um, so unless your system is metal, a rodent can chew its way through. I have even lost a Bakashi bin to a rodent that wanted to chew in because I left it out in the shed just for I was storing grain in it or something. I wasn't actually using it at the time. Uh, and they wanted the grain that was inside. I think it might have been chook food. <laughs> and so they just ate a hole through the lid and got in. Um, but what you can do is discourage them from moving in by not putting in the sorts of foods they want to eat um generally grains so i tend not to put in grains and bread into my compost um, because that's the sorts of things that attract rodents um, you can put your compost bin on um, a similar gauge metal to the cage there but obviously smaller squares like rodent size squares um, i wouldn't just use chicken wire one because rodents can fit through it but two any of the fine wires um, they'll just break down in the soil and they'll become more of a pain than a use so use quite a heavy gauge wire that holds its own kind of you know that's in a sheet not a roll um, if you are going to put your compost bin on something uh, and really if rodents move in rodents a bit like us they want a nice cozy warm environment that's not you know not wet and not disturbed so you know if you were trying to live in someone's house and they kept flipping the couch and hosing you <laughs> you wouldn't stick around for long so what you want to do if rodents move in is run your system really wet because they don't want it really wet um and just keep flipping the furniture so get in there with your turner and just keep turning it um it won't take long before they decide that it's going to be a lot more fun to live somewhere else <laughs> than where they're constantly getting flipped. Um, any other troubleshooting anyone wanted me to cover? So I'm conscious that we're close to nearly out of time. Other questions? Okay. Um, so next, I'll just move on to resources. So what I'll do when, obviously, because um, we've got a bit of a hiccup with my Amaze Ball's battery in my computer going flat. Um, that it'll, the video will be a bit disjointed. So what I'll provide with the video um, will be the presentation with some links written, but I might also just type them into the chat. Um, and that is, we've got a lot of free resources for you to use um, on Maribyrnong's compost community. Um, so if you go to that link, it also links from council's website, uh, then you can um, go under the section learn and actually go through all the worm farming, compost, bakashi resources, there's also chooks and a few other things. Um, and there's also a toolbox with uh, downloads, things like the worm map and that sort of thing are in the toolbox um, and council subsidizes compost systems for the Maribyrnong community so um, under order if you then um, select Maribyrnong um, just go in and follow the instructions and you can actually get a discount on compost systems in Maribyrnong as well. Now there's also a Facebook group where um, we've got a real mixture of people from raw beginners to there's one guy in the group who he's been composting for oh gosh 40 years he's amazing his knowledge is incredible he's a little bit unconventional at times um, but he just he's experimented and tried everything and you know he's just incredible at composting so there's there's all these people in the group that can just give you such mixed advice and feedback. Um, it's a really nice place for peer-to-peer -peer learning. There's no stupid question in the group um, because we're all different abilities. So it's a really great place to just go in and ask what you might think is a stupid or an obvious question. 10 other people like it, oh, I had the same question. Um, and then, yes, yeah, someone with more experience will jump on and tell you their spin on it and I'll jump on and give you my spin on it. And you'll get lots of different opinions that way. And then you can kind of try what works for you um, because my way is not the only way. You know, it's, it's one of many ways. Um, you know, I'm quite science-based and I tend to follow certain patterns, but I, you know, I'll bend rules for things that work for me, like tweaking the greens and browns. So yeah, just, um, yeah, good, good place to get on and get some information. Um, Pip, was there anything you wanted to add about Council's program or My Smart Garden before we see if there's any last questions? 
Um, so I'll just put a couple of extra links in the chat, um, one's to, to My Smart Garden, um, another one to our Sustainable Living Program, um, just because, yeah, there's lots of events that come up and, and they're all free, so I'd encourage everyone to come along. Um, and no, just to say thanks, thanks, Ella. It's actually, it's really nice and refreshing to be able to see like your garden and see um, systems live in action as well. I know, um, you know, it was unfortunate we had to move the program um, online, the, the Zoom session online, but um, you've done really well, so thank you. Thank you. No worries. And uh, yeah, I'll come up with some, some more technology for <laughs> get some power down here for next time. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much, everyone. Um, I'll, I'll chat with Pip and we'll get these videos merged and edited and tidied up a little bit without all the glitches um, and get that out to you. So at least you've got your refresher. Pip's popping up those links now. Um, so hopefully, Pip, when this session cuts out, my battery's about to die, um, <laughs> it'll save the chat and the links, but we can send them to you as well. So, Absolutely. Sounds yeah. good. All right. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Um, yeah, we'll add these links. To, I might add these links to the end of the Prezo as well. That's probably a, a good thing to do. I'll quickly save that before my battery dies. Yeah, that sounds great. And yeah, we'll, we'll reach out via the Eventbrite, so to, to your email addresses and, and send you, you know, the video link and, and all the other resources. So thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, everyone. Bye.